Meditation is one step further than prayer. That doesn't say man does not pray. And I don't want you to go with the idea that this is going to detract from a religious involvement of your life that you pray. Far from it. I'm only trying to point out that by the meditative process of disciplining the emotional nature, you will really know how to pray for the first time and discover that prayer is a means of communing with the higher self. In the meditation, you're asked to just close the eyes, but don't fall asleep. And try to keep the spine straight. And don't strain. Be as comfortable as possible. Because this entails conscious effort, and the conscious effort is discipline. Now the vital energy flows through the vital nerves and through the five senses into the physical organ and you are involved with the outside world through the senses of seeing, smelling, hearing, tasting and touch. Now, and everything involved in that outward realm is retained in the brain as language and the association through language. In the meditative principle, or discipline, we will shut down one of the avenues, that is the lids of the eyes, vision. And through this shutdown attitude, discipline of sight begins. While we close the eyes and look within and not falling asleep, we have a sense or a tendency to become more aware of our existence. Thus, a stepping up of your inner consciousness. And you begin to realize that the sense of hearing is taking over more. The sense of smell, sense of taste and touch are also becoming acute. To the extent that they're becoming extra perceptive. And as we gaze at the point between the eyebrows, with our eyes closed, keeping the mind there. Gradually, we will see a light or a radiance, a luminescence. Now the mind has a tendency to drift only because it was involved with the external realm and this is a form of discipline by trying to observe what the mind is latching on to what particular idea or word 
or association or thought or experience the mind is latching on to. And through this conscious observation or conscious discipline, the mind sometimes recognizes an idea or a thought creeping up from the past, some past experience. Now, if it's associating with that experience, eventually the emotional nature will become frustrated. If the mind is latching on to something concerning the future, sooner or later the emotional nature will end up in anxiety. Now, if the mind is involved in the present, now, what it's actually doing in relation to the body, then the sense of breathing, the function of breathing, begins to slow down. In the scriptures it is said, God breathed the breath of life into man, and the man became a living soul. At this very moment, in the present now, as the consciousness identifies itself with the present, and the slowing down rate of inhalation and exhalation, man is given an opportunity to experience his soul awareness. Taking of the qualities of the divine exhibits omnipresence that it seems to reach out and be present everywhere in consciousness. It seems to radiate into unlimited existence. workload of communion with the universal spirit of God. Ever conscious of the present now. vast ocean of peace and tranquility is all around you now in the form of consciousness. And the personal discipline of watching, the personal vigil is the link up 
with that vastness of consciousness from within ourselves. Now slowly open the eyes but don't move. Try to hold on to the peaceful after effects. But don't open the eyes too full, just partially. Because through your self-observation, there's a sensation of peace around you, in you and coming true from within you. There is a reservoir of peace flowing out from within. Now with this partially open eyes, we're gonna dive deeper back now into that vast ocean of consciousness again. So let us gradually close the eyes and go deep in now into this deep ocean of consciousness not fall asleep. Be conscious that you're applying personal effort, self-discipline on your emotional nature, aligning yourself with God, the eternal light within yourself.
You don't see one man having something or more than you. You see the universalness of it. It's a natural sign. <coughs> now, this Kriya, which quickens the evolution, and every one minute of it equals 365 days of cellular change. If it takes 365 days to make certain changes in the mechanism, one Kriya done correctly with the right temperature changes in the mechanism have the exact result. The exact thing can be measured, and it will be measured in time. Right now there are certain professors working on electrical equipment to verify just that at UCLA right now, to verify just those facts about the, the Kriya science. We're going to verify these things for Western man more and more because we need to verify it. Not to, you see, valid knowledge cultivates devotion, which cultivates faith. But to believe without valid knowledge cultivates superstition. So we have centuries of superstition brought on upon us. Now that is no fault of no one. It's the fact that valid knowledge could not be given to people before their time. We must have valid knowledge to work from so that we cultivate the devotion to it. Then we cultivate the faith in it. So we see God is a far more greater thing than we anticipated represents. We are moving to bigger and better understanding of self. Here we have, if you do one Kriya from the initial start to the initial end, you will just have a slight registration. This is a funny phenomenon too. It takes at least three Kriyas to have the equivalent of one Kriya. Now you understand, you're going to come into Einstein mathematics. Three equal to one. Uh, how you get this kind of mathematics? Three equal to one. Where what happened to the other two? If you start something from rest and raise it to a point and bring it back down, if there is no repetition or recurrence, you you've grounded the electrical charge. So it cancels itself out. So if you start off. One, two, three. Now you notice the first and last one will cancel themselves out and you have a genuine center one. Only the center one with a genuine movement. So the, general, the, the center one, or number two, actually registered on the mechanism. You see what I did? You start from here. Go one, two, three. But if I did one, there is no registration. If I did two, say one, two, there is no registration. But if I did three, we have a registration. One, two, three. The center one registered because it was making a complete loop in itself. See? One, two, three. You mean before and after? Before and after cannot register. As I said, why we have eight months, eight years, six months before and after the seven year period, we see the same <coughs> natural law applied in nature, applying itself back to the microcosm. The same principle is applying there, it doesn't change. The, the Eastern people did not change it, the Western people can't change it. <coughs> is to understand the terminology. <coughs> Jesus would say, as in heaven, so it is on earth. As it exists in what you call empty space, you know, you, you call it empty space, but there's no empty space, it exists in manifested space. This is manifested space, mass. So, as it exists there, it exists here. It's, now, we cannot see much of it here, why? Because we are limited to certain degrees of measurement. We can only see these things on larger scales of measurement. So we have to step off this planet to experience these conditions. 
and see these things in, in its true nature. But the sages did this in a different way. They did not do it by the extension of their senses. They did this by the independence of the senses. Now, we in the West are doing many things through the extension of our senses. We take a microscope to see something that is minute. We take a telescope to see something that is far. But these are registrations of measurement, minute and distance for eyes. Where independence of is to get in and transcend. And to do that would have to mean you'd have to evolve up. You'd have to speed up, accelerate this mechanism. So if this is an acceleration, one, two, three. One, two. And transcend. And to do that would have to mean you'd have to evolve up. You'd have to speed up, accelerate this mechanism. So if this is an acceleration, one, two, three, what is happening? You have one minute equal to 365 days happening to the human body. You're having an acceleration that is unique. So if you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, you look at the fan of a motor, what is it doing? An automobile has a certain RPM. Now, we take a bigger fan, a larger RPM, put it in front of the automobile, it's going to lift the automobile off the ground slowly. Put it bigger, we're going to get it higher, so it's going to push. So we say we're flying. You see, you feel this, the, the acceleration's all changing itself, yet we are calling it evolution. If we accelerate this mechanism, consciousness is speeded up. It widens out. And we begin to perceive now dimensions that were not there. We begin to perceive what is not there. The, the arc opens for the first time when we see the, the truth about ourselves. Now, no one likes to know that he's been following something for centuries and all of a sudden to wake up one day and find out he's a fool. It hurts him. But it's the best way to start. So we hurt one time and to pick up from the broken pieces and start all over the steps again. For centuries, the layman has always known he lived in a three-dimensional world. And not too long, I think about 20, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, we went to the movies and we see two-dimensional movies, and one day we said, oh, we're going to have 3D, three-dimensional movies, you see. Well, it's a strange phenomenon. When you tell him, it's impossible because all these things are there, he says, no, I don't see all these things. I only see two, and I see three now. But if you see, the fourth one is there too, he doesn't see that. Well, here is an object. Most of us will say we see the length of it, the width of it, and the depth. None of us say we can see the time in it. Yet the time is there. When you measure with your stick, and this is what Kriya is trying to point out to you, how you accelerate yourself. When you measure, you're using a measurement for length, breadth of a substance. Where is the full thing, the time in it? You got a measurement on your hand, which is called a clock. It measures time. So it's existing now five or seven minutes after nine. 1965, and this is another name relating to that condition. And if I say, it's like existing in motion? You say, no, it's not. It's static. And I show you that this thing left a certain, uh, was to lift it up and hit, throw it across the room at you at a certain speed. It will reach at your, in front of you in a given time. The motion was already there. It had to travel a certain distance with a given time. So you measure that given distance. So that's another dimension. Dimension is only mentioned, measurement. You see the, the, the fifth one there. Now, the idea to lift it and throw it is mine. So this thing also has a reaction to mine. Because it's also an idea, another man's idea who molded the substance to make it look like this. To register to you back, to your mind, to photograph mentally. So you got that next dimension there, the idea pattern. 
the amount of pressures applied on the substance to mold it. So we see. And finally, we see the will. The intensity to make it against all the odds. Everybody calling you crazy nut when you try to say you want to make something. And you ever run into people who say, oh man, you, you'll fail before you start? Everybody's trying to tell you you'll fail before you start to do anything. Your will is there. And you say, where there's a will, there's a way. Now we see it there. Now Kriya is showing you this. If you can or realize that all this is here in this body, and if you can make this revolution in the spinal column, and an alteration of the temperature ratio, you have done exactly what nature would do if you eat, sleep, went to bed, got up, work, in 365 days. You would have the same adjustment. That is a slow movement. This is a faster movement. It's a measurement movement. One is speeded up. Now, the first thing you will notice if you are take uh, eight years to do a certain amount of studies in uh, science, you'll find all the ups and downs, the resistances, the adjustment periods, the mutation periods, the molding of pattern periods, the saturation periods, the lag, the frustration periods, and eventually the, the new recurrence or the new impetus. You start all over for eight years. You go through this, in any problem, you go through the same repetition over and over. You don't seem to get out of it. It's comes like a, a rat race. You're stuck. Now, your attitude has to come back to yourself to get this thing to go into yourself. Now, if you can recognize this, you can speed these various movements up. The various resistance periods can be reduced. The period of adjustment can be reduced. The period of change can be reduced. The period of molding or pattern can be reduced. The period of saturation, period of boredom can be reduced. The period of lag or the new impetus, the new inspiration, all can come on faster because it's coming from the self. We say that it's coming from the superconscious mind or cosmic mind, the new inspiration, the new idea, the new impetus, the new drive, coming from there. Only because we are stimulating it. We are revving it up. We are revving up the motor. As we rev it up, you get your brain starts to work faster. Now, as it works faster, the first phenomena is always calmness. Never this. You never find that when you realize yourself that you're going to be in a state of agitation. You'll find that your entire control of your mechanism is under your will. Your will is always controlling each function momentarily. And you're always moving in full control. You, because where are you going to use it? You see, the question is where would you use this force? Most of us, and for centuries, have used this force for many things. The sages don't want us to use it for ridiculous things. They want us to realize the full potential and work for the upliftment of, of your fellow men. And this is a hard concept to understand, that you have to work for the upliftment of your fellow men. Most of us are working for the upliftment of himself. So we say, good, I want cosmic consciousness for me. And this is the attitude we all take. We're all guilty, so I'm no exclusion. The yearning for realization takes on a personal interest, self-interest. And before that self-interest became manifest, it, had, it was existing in a state of inertia. So you exert a little effort and you get out of the state of inertia, and that's what Kriya is supposed to do for you, as you exert a little effort. And you don't want to eat, wait eight years to exert some effort, because eight years nature is going to push you anyhow by pain or suffering to get out and do something to concern yourself. With the Kriya, you stimulate this action in your mechanism and you raise yourself from inertia, 
But the next step you go is your own personal interest. You want this information, this power of consciousness for yourself. Sooner or later you realize it's not for you. You couldn't use it. It's not you. It is for the whole of, of the universe. Then you begin to act. Those actions necessary for the continuance of life. You don't act for things that are necessary only for you. You don't realize that some things you are doing are for the continuance of life around you until it's shown to you that that is what you've been doing. And this gives you a good feeling. Well, the good feeling is bliss. Now, remember that word bliss. Kriya, when it revs it up, gives bliss. Bliss is joy too, you know. Now, in the East we say, Anandam, bliss. We exist, which is sat. We are conscious, which is knowing. And that's chit. For the purpose of being blissful, Anandam, sat chit Anandam, we classify it there in the East. In the West, we have the same, a man said to Jesus, Master, what is your God? He said, my God is a God of joy. He couldn't name it anything else. He couldn't describe it anything else. He just described the word joy. And joy is related to bliss already. So if bliss and joy are frames of reference for a feeling, and if you practice Kriya and feel the same thing, we see now we have a linkage. We see a common bond for the first time. There's a common bond going on. This universe is here for the joy of ourselves. Now with this joy becomes ecstasy. We use this word ecstasy as the person is very ecstatic. And he goes into reverie. Yes, he does. But what is ecstatic and what is reverie? Outside is not ecstatic and reverie inside. There are many things going on inside. Until you get inside, you will not see that. We can be deluded by the ecstasy, deluded by the reverie too. And that becomes like an opiate. Just as much as uh, chloroform or some narcotic is an opiate too for telling the senses. Real ecstasy, real reverie is something entirely different. So the sages even themselves will tell you, don't get stuck in that. Go on, march on, get beyond that. Now, ecstasy, X means out. And stasi is static already. Out of the static manifestation, your sense of perception has to reach out of static condition in order to see it in motion. So when a sage says, look at you and says, this whole universe is in motion, you think he's not. You know? A scientist comes along and validates him <laughs> and says, yes, this whole universe is uh, in motion. Then everybody, oh my God, what did I follow? You find out the sage was always right, we are wrong. The sage knows what he's talking about, but the sage can't shock us psychologically to make the bridge too fast because this will not allow us to want to discover ourselves. He feeds us like a mother feeds a child a little at a time, you know, put it in your mouth and sooner later you swallow, come on, take some more. But if he was to give you the full shock of the knowledge of the science about yourself, you put it. The, the, the thing is that you can't stand the shock. So you have to be given a little at a time. And you have to coax you with symbols. You know, we are very uh, reluctant at times even to change from one thing to another. It's so ridiculous when we see something that is much better for something that we're holding on to and we, we put all our confidence that this is it, and we see something better, we don't want to let go. And that's attachment too. The sage is trying to look, let go, experience this, uh, and you can come back. Don't get stuck here. This is what Kriya is for to do for you. It is to rev you up, to loosen you up from within, so that you can speed up your adjustment periods. You can speed up the resistance periods. You can speed up the change periods. It can speed you up to experience the saturation period in a shorter space of time. Imagine if you have food here every day, they bring the same food, after a while you're going to be fed up over and over the same thing, one after the other, you're going to be fed up. <laughs> now, if you have that as an 
example of being frustrated in one thing. He always in millions of things to be frustrated with. Now, the says that Priya is a quickening of this process, or an accelerating process, which is, helps you to transcend the thing, adjust faster, get over it, and release yourself from it. As you understand that, he tells you at the same time, every time you do this Kriya, and you alter this mechanism, you alter the electrical output. This is a strange phenomenon, but those who have never seen it will not believe it. We'll take a fruit, and those who have seen it have done it in Houston, take a fruit and hold it. Concentrate upon it and leave it, and remain without rotting the normal way for a whole year. But that is not to boast, those things you don't boast to them, that is the law of nature, you don't live it. It is there to demonstrate a fact about yourself. Why? If I explain the law, you see the truth. If you see the truth, you don't use it for that demonstration, you use it for this. You use it to live properly. You live to solve basic problems that people have, psychologically, physically, and emotionally, or spiritually. Now that was only an illustration to tell them that you got life at your control. Now, what was a saint? A saint doesn't want to impress nobody that, and a saint is a man who is practicing a regenerative principle. You are all saints in the making. When you stop degenerating your mechanism, and Kriya is to, to regenerate you, not to degenerate you. Now, you say a degenerate is a person who will drink, fall down the gutter, or hang around in the bars, that's a degenerate. The sage don't say that's a degenerate. A degenerate is one who thinks and generates ideas that tear down the mechanism from within itself constantly. He may not, he could be sitting here and looking at you over there and be hating your guts. And he is degenerating. You see? But I may not feel his hate. The hate don't bounce through me, it go back to him. You follow what I mean? And yet if he says he's loving me, he's generating again, but that love may come true by his gesture, his mood, and his expression, and I will feel it. I will go back, and it will nourish him. The sages know that. That's why they say, regenerate yourself. By regenerating yourself, you now can alter these mechanisms. You can alter these conditions. But you enhance this electrical frequency every day by this crib. The actual technique is involved in initiation. Now there is where we come to the third initiation. No one gets into a the inner functioning of the science unless he's initiated. An initiation is a sacred rite. In the East it was called baptism at one time. Uh, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, which is the outward symbol of initiation, and Jesus will baptize you with the Spirit, which is the inward initiation. But in the East, where the masses, they've all initiated their disciples. And there's where the word disciple comes into. From the time the guru initiates the disciple, he turns the electrical charges on, and the, the disciple is polarized or magnetized with the guru's force. They are linked now, endlessly, in time. There is no break. Your guru has always, will always be your guru, time in a time of body form and body form. The link is there. You never separate. All is going on. Now, the disciples of Jesus were linked to him because he initiated them. And each guru gives the initiation to one disciple to pass it on. And they're called keys. Now, Jesus in the West gave the keys to one of his disciples, and that was Peter. I give you the keys of the kingdom, and the kingdom is the power in yourself. I give you the technique 
that you can pass it on now to future disciples. And each disciple of a guru is given this initiation, is given the technique that he passes it on. Now we see why we are linked to a group of masters. You cannot uh, jump into initiation and realize yourself by claiming some invisible individual as a guru. He has to have lived, he has to hammer out your consciousness with his, his will. He has to hammer you into form to, in, to, to points where you don't want to go. You, you lead a horse to the water, but this is time the horse has to drink regardless. He don't want to go. He'll you know, hammer you there too. So, but the gurus are not trying to do that today. Years ago, yes. Not now. They're not forcing you. You know why? You destroy yourself at your own rate. We're not no longer going to force you to accept truth. As long as you want to destroy yourself at your own rate, we will be around. We'll let Mother Nature spank you as a naughty child and you'll come back to the higher, the, the, your elder brothers or spiritual brothers on the path of truth and they will give you back the truth. But Mother Nature, they will let her do the work because they know the more we stray from truth, she has many ways to correct us. She's going to let us invent our own self-destruction, our own self-sufferings in order to discover truth. That's why the gurus are not interfering now. They would have interfered at one time, but no, not now. They are disseminating the truth. Take it for what it is. They know where they are. They're not going to force no one. The truth is there. You want it, but it's fine. No matter. It makes no difference. They are marching on. Man is marching on, either to his own degeneration, or he steps out of the crowd and begins to regenerate himself. This is his choice. Now, why they want freer, no one again, not for any motive of personal gain. They only want the Korea to be known once and again in this age, East and West, that it will be recorded, made available at all times, whereas it was held in the brains of men, was never put down on objects as a record. Now, if you record something, their personality comes out of the picture. Uh, man will evolve and will not want to pay respect to any of these personalities because you get so sophisticated in his scientific awareness that no human being stands greater than himself. And I could never say that, not even at the stage where I am. I owe all mine to my guru. And Jesus would tell you the same. This is the way of righteousness. He owes all his to his guru. That's why he made John baptize you. We must pay the reverence because it is the way of righteousness, which is means it is the attitude of the law of the cosmos that we respect that which is handed down to us. Not from out of adoration or from out of uh, kowtowing and worship. This is the source, you see. And we must, we res must also have respect for the source. Now all the great gurus have come and they have many disciples and the various world religions are offspring of these but there is a common link in all of them sooner or later we find the common harmony the common knowledge the common brotherhood which is the common science once we realize that the man in the east is practicing exactly what you are practicing he may call it a different terminology but it's exactly the same you're not going to go around and say the guy is a pagan and he over there is not going to go around call you a nut over here because once he realizes the same thing, you, then we find out we have now a giving forth of ourselves. The first time we can really give of ourselves. We are performing an action necessary for the continuance of life. So Kriya, when the energy is raised and lowered and the temperatures are changed in the spine 
It's the equivalent of one year of natural evolution. It takes three to give one. The actual technique is initiation. That I cannot give you until the person wants to initiate it. And that is a sacred right. Now, I'm giving you the fundamentals that lead to the truth that's always been there. And there's a saying, if you have the right information concerning what is involved, you can take it from there and go on. If you don't have the right information, then you're going to end up in the line alleys. Yes? This uh, repetition of three, uh, can you transpose that in the, in the use in practical everyday uh, wood, for instance, uh, practicing something for memory or practicing something for uh, other purposes? Is, is that sequence of three uh, effective as a cycle? Other things than uh, the Kriya? No, no. The Kriya is basically for one thing the enhancing of the entire mechanism at a ratio of one year to one revolution. The equivalent of one year's natural physical unfolding by nature, the equivalent of one revolution in the spinal column. Now you have six centers and one grand center, which we call the sun and man, and the six centers along the spinal column. They represent exactly the sun and the planets or the zodiac. See, we have 12 signs in the zodiac, so you have six centers by polarity, which means each one is a positive negative function. And the energy rises and lowers itself and make the transmutation. The six functions relate themselves automatically with the zodiac. Now this may sound strange, the word zodiac and all these things may seem way out in some uh, paraphernalia or astrology, but it's not. It's genuine science. Because you couldn't put a spacecraft into space and not run into the zodiac. You <laughs> see, you have a zodiac here all going all by itself. The natural zodiac is here. So man, man's evolution is space colonization and space transplantation. That is evolution. But that's only one phase of his evolution. Also, man's ability to live in space and man's ability to govern himself through space and from space. But here he lives on Earth. He don't think we are just the only uh, planet here that's got all the little Jews here that are all gods by themselves. You know, this is a ridiculous thought. Uh, here we are all gods in this Earth, and you look in the sky and you see umpteen billion planets, but there's nothing there. We are going to find out many things that we don't understand right now here in this plane when we put our, ourselves there. There are lots of things we have to rechange. And there are lots of things that we will discover that are happening here to indicate what is happening here. For instance, if man on earth has the basic ability, one of the basic abilities to accelerate his vision so that he can look through the wall and see what's on the other side. And this is not a common trait. This is one function. It's an acceleration. So acceleration of vision, so he calls it in his layman language, clairvoyance or X-ray vision. This is one of the basics. One of the now, this is not the overall aspect. And if this planet is only four and a half billion years old, you mean to tell me the light that is coming from the sun at a rate of four and a half minutes, 106,000 miles a second, and all the uh, forms of plants are existing there who are behind us, in evolution. Don't you see, uh, it's how preposterous thought we would think we are thinking in ourselves, how foolish we're thinking. They are way ahead in evolution. Therefore, alterations are going to be different. Now, if on Earth we have individuals having the ability to perform by location, you see me here, and in Houston they can see me. That's by location, to be in two places at the same time. Now, if this is happening only on planet Earth, 
and this is just a small one function of knowledge of this atomic mass and exerting the will upon it. <coughs> you want to understand what is happening in more evolved life forms, that this is passe. You understand? They will be doing things that we could not withstand here. And some of the gurus have demonstrated it. Why they demonstrated it is to make us conscious of what we are. <coughs> now, man is constantly building and controlling his environment to suit himself. And he has to take his environment with him wherever he goes. The Korea scientist does not take the environment where he goes. He changes himself to the environment and he goes where he wants to go. Time and space has no interference with him. Any planet is there for him. This is a strange statement, sounds like fiction, but it's a fact of the Korea science. These men are typical examples, only we've just seen a few. <laughs> there are many silent ones working behind the scenes. Uh, just as an uh, African living in Africa who you may not know he's the chief of his tribe is working behind the scenes as far as your continent is concerned. See what I mean? You have no relationship to him, so you don't know he exists. Just as much, he lives there all his life with his family and his tribe and doesn't know a place like Dallas exists. And we also live in a world with many things happening and we don't know it exists. And it's happening all around us because we don't have the consciousness to cope with it. So, Kriya is to quicken this overall consciousness to alter this mechanism to suit the environment. Now, this will make you function better, more effectively, in all aspects. Memory, anything you want, not a cycle of tree. The fact is that if you do the Kriya, this enhances those fa functions in your mechanism at a ratio of one year to one Kriya. Do you get the picture now? Do I understand that you're suggesting that we do extend our senses uh, and that we can extend them, and that it's uh, right to extend yes. them, but that isn't the only thing we need to do. We need to uh, create this vacuum that you were talking about first and learn uh, Kriya. Let's see what that other term was. Uh, you used opposite to extending your, your senses to... Uh, Independent of. Independent of. You learn the independence of them in order to accelerate them more effectively. It. Right. You must first shut down in order to go forward. As I said, if you're in a craft and you want to raise one point, you go the opposite direction and you end up the other point. If you want to go this, you got to go the other way. This is what you call space mechanics. It's a strange term, you have to use it, but it is spiritual truth. As much as you retreat in, that is how much you advance outward. It's another way of putting it. This is the one principle going on all the time. You go three steps forward, no, three step step one. Back. Right. So you're making three movements to one. It's a funny phenomenon, but this is Einstein mathematics too. So we more, more we understand how we are living, we understand the complexities. But nevertheless, in the complexities there is simplicity. The simplicity is the fact that now, you can bring your consciousness here at the point of yourself and feel it all the time. When you do this, charge is increased. Secondly, the peace, the serenity, and the sharpness of consciousness is there. The wisdom is there. It starts trickling in. It's not something you go around reading to memorize. It's not going to come. With the power of this knowledge comes down from inside. You've got to go into it. It's there. 
You follow what I mean? But you got to practice the thing. Any other questions? I probably have, but I don't want to the floor. No. I'll just try a little meditation, because we try to understand what meditation leads to Kriya. And as I said, this is a preparation for Kriya. We need to know a little more before we can do the actual initiation. That's again someone's choice. Point is this. I'm telling you of the signs, how it came to be in this part of the world, where it was lost, how it comes back, where it is taking us. Now, where it's taking us into space life. And that is its destination in the first place. And that's our destination in the first place. We're not here to walk around like little gods, flattering rosary and so forth. Those are juvenile forms of religion. Adult religion, or adult living, or maturity of consciousness, is taking up your cross and following me. That's what Jesus meant. Now, he could not say that if he was dead, because he died on the cross. And to say something before he died on it would be a ridiculous statement. He said this to, while he was alive, take up your cross and follow me. Follow me who? Not Jesus. We have to understand what this man is talking about. You have to lift up the forces in your mechanism, which come up this way and they come this way too, as a positive and negative, and they meet. Where they meet, they meet in me, the, the center. Where do you point? Me? Do you point me here? This is mine. This is mine. Where do you point? Me. <laughs> what you say, if you want to identify, who, who that belongs? Me, mine. You always seem to be pointing at a central point. So, take up these forces, positive and negative in the spinal column, and bring them back in, and merge. And when you merge, the consciousness opens, you see the reality. You see the first time what the reality is. But you cannot interfere, and you're not supposed to interfere. You're supposed to see where you fit in. And you're supposed to render service, render action necessary for the continuance of it. That's why we heal. But what do we heal? We don't heal Joe Dove or Mary Smith. The healing is based on healing the entire cosmos. Because man is endowed and privileged to have a body form for the first time and many times. But every time, it's the first time that he recognizes it. Anytime he relates himself to it, as being the opportunity of cultural growth, cultural evolution, then he is enhancing the universe with his kind. So, what does he heal? He has to heal the entire elemental kingdom that has been disrupted. He has to heal the entire mineral kingdom that has been disrupted. He has to heal the entire vegetable kingdom. He has to heal the entire animal kingdom. He has to heal the entire human kingdom. And that's what I want to say on this planet Earth. The entire, that means physical, astral, causal. And he has to heal the entire spiritual kingdom. Then he has to come back to the kingdom within himself, which is the cosmic self inside. So, when he does this, now he's never left out. See, it's, that's why Jesus said, better to give than to receive, because you're never left out. And if I think of you, and I show you the illustration tonight, on the reservations, there are meetings going on, and they heal it like this. We have eight people in a room, and if we heal it, one man heals seven. And if each man heals seven, we have seven times seven, so each man is healed 49 times. The multiple force that is built up for one man's uh, development and evolution by the aid of such a com uh, complex principle and yet a simple principle. You don't think of yourself when you vibrate this force, so your ego is not in the place, and yet you have 49 vibrations bombarding you for your upliftment. And you have contributed to seven men. You see? And seven men have contributed to you. I do have a question. Uh, the uh, physical, mental, and emotional relaxation to which you referred, uh, you mentioned uh, some of the uh, 
uh, first indications or the various indications. Uh, will you name those things that we can sense as indications of reaching the degree or degrees of relaxation? The five senses begin to shut down. Mm -hmm. Now, the body feels kind of flaccid, stiff, like if you're just waking up from sleep or you're going to sleep. The breathing slows down. Well, I meant, uh, you, you said calmness. Uh, calmness, tranquility, these are first. A heightening of the electrification of the cells. The electricity is heightened. Calmness. Calmness, tranquility, or peace. You find this in a peace now. Peace that passes all understanding. For the first time you have shanti. You know, profound peace. You find it for the first time within yourself. The profoundness of it. Now, you feel this peace, and it's profoundly deep and moving. Everything is within itself and holy. Then you feel the whole body is electrified. You will notice also the texture of the tissues begin to change over a period of time. Also you begin to notice the odor of the perspiration begins to change. The senses become more acute. They begin to accelerate now. Your adjustment to heat and cold is faster. You walk into a cold room and your body adjusts to heat it up faster. So everybody is cold, you're warm. You walk into a warm room, everybody is irritable, you adjust and you're cool. You see the evolution that is speeded up? These are some, some of, <laughs> I'm just giving you some of. The, I'm not going to too deep ones because if you can't get the sum of, how are you going to get the other ones? <laughs> you know, and then I'm making this thing uh, way out of proportion and way out of reach. But the masters never do that. They never made it tough. They made it tough for me, yes. But some of these, as you mentioned, some of these are mental, some are emotional, and some are, are uh, physical. And yes. that's what you were given. Some manifestations of each of these three areas where we arrive at this. Yeah. Well, well, in the in the mental realm, you, your whole attitude begins to change. You start to have a different perspective of things. You don't get as irritable. Your moods begin to adjust faster. You don't offer as much resistance. You don't think up resistances. You don't let the resistance affect you. So you have an adjustment to the resistance, which is psychological. You have a change to the resistance, which becomes physiological and psychological. And you have a pattern. After 10 minutes, the pattern is set in. You made it complete. Then comes the saturation. How long you want to stay in the atmosphere or that particular environment. Then comes the lag, because it, takes a, it drags on. Then comes recurrence or new impetus which comes out now from the superconsciousness because that's inspiration. You have a new idea to do things, a new way to do things then. So we say, you will always have a new model of the same old thing. And every year you'll always be looking for a new model. Every new joy is God. Every new model projection is cosmic self. You see, you're constantly projecting the creativity of yourself. Now, you're drawing from a cosmic principle. You're drawing from God, which is law. God is there. Reverence is there. Personality is there. Now these cosmic masters claim, and I have to practice it myself, it's easier to think of God as mother than to think of God as father. And if uh, some of us here don't want to think they're uh, that humbly enough to think of God as mother, think of him as father. And some of us don't want to think of him as any personality. God is the conscious light. God has become me. You see? Then we, we free ourselves from any so-called sophistication of mind.
but whatever you want to call him, the whole important thing is that you got to feel it. You got to be in it. You got to experience the thing anytime you want to dip into it. It's there. You don't remember. You can't drink up the ocean. You dip in the ocean all the time. It's like a sugar. You don't want to become sugar. You want to have the ability to utilize the sugar momentarily. So meditation is a uh, condition which you not only go in, you merge and get the consciousness, but you need it, you come out, you work, you apply action, you apply service. It's not to sit down and loaf with it. It's not going to do anything. You have to exert action. To exert action is to fit to the cosmic will. So he says, thy will be done. We are fitting ourselves to it. That clear up your uh, question? Yes. Uh, this last thing you said then would be that you know, yes. then you be, and then you do. Yes. This is the sequence. You know, be, and do. This will eliminate all the, the, the... Now, if you could pick up my thought waves that beam it into you, then you would know that all you have to do is this. And you're ready for whoever you want to work on. The force is here now. Get it? But you can't. So you have to pull back. Remember, masters, all of them have different ways of projecting. But they just can't impose. They do not impose. They have no... It's an inalienable right. You have the inalienable right to reject them all times. This is your right. In other words, you even have the right to keep God out from your heart. That's the freedom of choice. I mean, Choose either well, way. that is the deterioration of the soul. You can choose to let it deteriorate. Right. <laughs> you see, if you can choose to be spiritual, and you can choose not to be spiritual, don't you see, freedom of choice leads to deterioration? It isn't that choice is not important. Don't get me wrong, and don't go say Adana says choice is not important. Choice is an important function, but unerring choice is the important function. How can you know you have unerring choice? By reason alone? Not possible. You have to transcend it. To transcend it is by intuition. And intuition is to get back in independence of dependence. Then you can say you are executing unerring choice. An unerring choice leads to freedom, not free will. Freedom. Jivan Mukta. Emancipation. Liberation. Liberation from the effects of your own self-created actions. It leads you away from those effects. You see the, the point now? Why you want an unerring choice? It leads you away from that. Well, let's have a little meditation. Oh boy. Man goes fast. You notice by letting the sound waves bounce in the body, the whole mechanism starts to get into a rhythm. Feel. And before you know it, you're starting to step away from the mechanism in consciousness. The consciousness does seem to expand. You're having your expansion in consciousness. See, that until one learns to feel more than listen to sound waves bombarding the body, he would not understand the principle of mind and its function of acceleration. You are not able to use thought waves properly. Because everything we see around us is a manifestation of thought waves. And these thought waves have been hammered by dominant will over obstacles to appear as they are. So where there is a will, there is a way. But until we understand 
this principle, we cannot use dominant will. But the masters have taught us to recognize evolution of the will. And from that, we can now develop dominant will. They tell us to watch a child when it's born. The moment they cut the umbilical cord, automatic will steps in, forces the lung to expand, air breathes, it cries, sound. This is their first indication of automatic will, automatic volition. Nothing moves except by a cosmic will or, or volition. So they say if you study that indication, you can see the next indication. The next indication is on thinking will. The child does not think with itself. So you feed it and you tell it what to do. And it hurts you. So you are molding the child. The will is molded. Now if the parent is not evolved, then we have undeveloped children. So we get the next stage, blind will, where we see juvenile delinquents fall into. The first re revolting, first manifestation of psychological revolution is against the unthinking will to express itself but it expresses itself blindly. Now, in blind will, we can be hurt by the social laws of man or by the cosmic laws around us. After a few hurts, a few mistakes, then we develop thinking will. We learn from mistakes and we try and error. There we, our evolution seems to come to an end. We never seem to get out of that jackpot. We never seem to go any further. You go right up to the grave with your thinking will. Just a few of us seem to develop dynamic dominant will. To do that, we have to understand this mechanism. That willpower is desire plus energy. No desire, no energy, no willpower. Power is energy, will is desire. Intrinsic craving, but motivated by an ID. So if you have the ID and you crave the ID, which is the concentration, energy is released, and you have dynamic will. So by picturing the idea, see the sages teach to visualize the object. We are entitled to anything we want, providing we want the consequences too. So we must learn the truth about ourselves. We have a right to manifest and we have a right to pay the price for manifestation. So we are responsible. You reap what you sow. Christian teaching is the same thing. That Eastern teaching is the same cause and effect. Same law underlying it all, the power to visualize. If you visualize correctly and exert this dominant will or energy behind it, to materialize. But we must understand one thing. If we have the willpower, and we have this, is, and this willpower is equal to our desire plus our energy behind it, there is something in us that has to be cancelled out, and that is breath. And one asks, how is that possible? In the highest aspects of dynamic will, you are breathless. In the lowest aspects of the dynamic will, you are breathing very fast, very shallow. 
and one little illustration is in fear. Your, your body is in a state of fear and you breathe very fast, but your will is trying to exert control over this body to offset. And some people say, calm down, calm down, relax. These are words or suggestions to bring you back to yourself. And if the breath tones down back, for a brief second, if you make what is called breathlessness, there is a change. Each of us have passed through these phases, but many of us do not realize this. We don't seem to relate it to ourselves. But these are laws of life. So the sages have placed a formula for us always to apply dynamic will when we need it. And that is desire or idea times the energy, which is the natural body power, times the breath, divided by the breath. That is, the inhalation and exhalation cancels each other out. And we have conscious energy. Conscious energy vibrates in an unobstructed universe. We live in an unobstructed universe because this is time-space continuum. If the chances are a million to one that you will touch an atom if you put your hand <coughs> through that object, because it's all empty space. Yet that empty space is waves, waves of consciousness. And this object differs from that object by a rate of vibration. And an idea is what you recognize it by. The impulse of the concentration is how you alter it. So we see it's possible now that what these sages are talking lie within the realm of application. We have a choice to manifest, to convince ourselves. But that's not the reason why they, we can do that. The reason and purpose of true manifestation is to correct our behavior. You see, the sages all are examples of transcendental behavior. They're, that is cosmic engineering, cosmic life engineering. They know the art of behavior. We don't know. So we have ups and downs, obstacles. Every time we can picture the idea or the problem that is interfering, direct the energy anywhere, we have no psychosomatic reconstruction instead of psychosomatic destruction or disease. Now I show you psychosomatic disease. You can't take a hand though. And this can be duplicated by hypnosis too. And in psychosomatic reconstruction, you uh, can, if the hand is there, send the energy through it by concentration. Now, this is no magic. This is law of life. This is God. Yeah. What was this formula again on this idea? Idea times energy times breath divided by breath equals conscious energy. Until you understand the formula, you can't use it properly. But if you can understand the formula and know that you live in seven dimensions right now, you can alter all your frequencies in the body to suit the environment you live in. Now this is man unlimited, not man the unknown or man the limited. Let's see, three physical dimensions and four Theory, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. The fourth dimension is time. <coughs> Length, breadth, and width are three dimensions as an object. And the fourth dimension is that the object resides in a certain time. Now, uh, uh, this is a ruler. A watch is a ruler. What are you measuring? 
the time you came to this house, the time you go away, but you sit there, the object is sitting in time. Now, time is relative to the light of the sun on this planet. How are you going to relate your time? So that's a movement too. We take four and a half minutes from the sun to here. So by the time the light gets here, it's past time when it left the sun. It's four and a half minutes late. You understand? So you live in time right now. Now that's the fourth dimension. Now, also, there is motion. If I was to lift you up and throw you across the room, that would be a motion. It would take me a certain amount of time to move you across a certain distance. And that would require a certain amount of power behind the idea of lifting you up and moving you. You see? So the idea to lift you or apply that pressure upon you to move you is mind. And the volition is the desire and the energy locked up in it, which is the will. They're all here now. You don't have to go looking for it. It's here. So they say, they say, conscious energy, if you understand it, you now can focus your consciousness and bring the thing down into manifestation. I'll give you a little illustration. Once I went to visit my guru's ashram in California. And I went inside the place, a small room, and I've seen food, not in refrigeration, just a little plastic paper over it, in 1952, shipped from India in a state of non-decay. He just broke a piece to eat it. The rest is still there. You can go fight with that. Now, we say that is a miracle, because we don't know. Logical mind or untrained mind says it's a miracle. Yes, it's a miracle, because it's something you don't understand. And miracle is the limitation of your understanding. But if your understanding is expanded, it's no longer...